Hi, everyone. I'm here to talk a little bit about uh, connecting external network resources to OpenStack, um, because that's a need that often occurs. First, a couple of words where I come from. It's uh, running public clouds, basically, um, in uh, multiple countries, uh, also some community clouds and private clouds and stuff like that. So we have lots of re different requirements from different customers when it comes to how they want to connect external resources. There are also some physical servers um, that are hosted for customers, which means that you have to connect it to be able to connect the virtual resources to um, actual physical resources. Uh, we mostly run Rocky. Uh, we use OpenStack Ansible on uh, Ubuntu uh, for provisioning OpenStack and use uh, Neutron ML2 uh, Open vSwitch combination for uh, for networking. So what use cases do we have? Of course, there are very many different, uh, uh, different needs for different customers. Uh, some, some of those uh, connections that are going to be created needs to be isolated to specific customers, especially in the uh, public cloud. If you need some, a customer needs some special way to connect to other resources, it's nothing that uh, any other customers should be able to use. Of course, internet access uh, is another way to connect to, um, to external resources. Uh, connecting to existing VLANs, uh, that can be used either to transport data to another locations or just to physical servers in the, the same data center or whatever. Uh, remote locations. Uh, a customer might want to connect uh, their OpenStack virtual resources to their own office or their own, their own data center and has to have way to, ways to uh, communicate even to tenant networks, not just um, the provider networks. And we have uh, some customers might bring their own uh, uh, network, subnet, that they are, have uh, registered through RIPE or any other, other equal uh, association, and so they might need a spe customer-specific floating IP pool to, to be able to use IP addresses from, um, from that uh, subnet instead of the general, uh, generally available uh, floating IP pools. So floating IP pools. Um, of course, you can use uh, floating IP pools both with private or public addresses. Uh, this is the general way that customers uh, use for internet access. And uh, uh, of course, NAT is performed on the network nodes in this case. And uh, the traffic egress is uh, on the network nodes as well. Uh, it can be combined with address scope and subnet pools. Uh, and I'll get a little bit more into that uh, in a couple of slides. So the floating IP pools, uh, pros with those are, of course, that they are very widely used. It's uh, simple to reserve and move addresses between res resources. Uh, you get, just attach and attach uh, that, uh, the address you need. Or you can even keep it in uh, uh, reserved for you, uh, even if it's not attached to a specific resource. Uh, some cons there, it requires NAT, which might uh, not be, um, be uh, desired. Uh, network nodes might become bottlenecks as they have to do the NAT, uh, routing and NAT, and uh, you can't egress directly from, um, from the compute nodes in this case. And they are shared between users. So how do you set up floating IP pools? It's, uh, that, that is pretty basic. You set up uh, by creating a net network, external network. Uh, specify uh, the network type and uh, which FISNet, uh, physical network it should be connected to, and a segmentation ID, uh, usually a VLAN. Uh, and then you create a subnet on that uh, uh, network. Uh, also, as I said, you could, um, could use address scopes uh, to be able to uh, use routable, uh, to, to uh, mitigate the last uh, con uh, that it required NAT. Uh, 
Uh, in this case, you could use an address scope, create an address scope, and then create a link network uh, in that address scope, and then a subnet pool. Uh, sorry, a subnet pool uh, that you use for link networks, and a subnet pool that is used for the actual networks that customers can can provision. Uh, and then you create the external network with, uh, and make sure that it is in, the, uh, in this address scope, which means that the network node will see the external interface will be on the um, link network, and the uh, internal interface uh, on the tenant network will be on the, um, uh, in the same address scope, which means that it won't do any NAT between. And also you will be, make sure that uh, the routable addresses that the customer use will not overlap because uh, when it will assign addresses from the subnet pool. Uh, in this case, you use a, I used a slash 16 for the subnet pool uh, for the tenant networks and, in, and the slash 24s uh, in this case will be assigned from that network. Uh, then you can do the same thing. You can make great uh, customer-specific floating IP pools. That's basically the same thing, but uh, you, will, uh, you will use um, access control by creating RBAC rules and the uh, policy access as external, which will create, make it possible to limit this to certain pro projects, customer projects. So you can have a, a customer that has their own um, uh, floating IP pools. And basically the same uh, pros and cons, except for, um, for the fact that it is not shared between customers, so you can use this for, for uh, specific customer needs. And basically the only difference here is that uh, the last command, that you do an uh, RBAC create, and uh, create an uh, access as external policy for, uh, for the specific network. Uh, which makes it seeable only by uh, that user as an external network, that project as an external network. Then we have shared provider networks. Uh, those are directly attached. Uh, you can directly attach uh, virtual machines to provider networks. Uh, in this case, you can egress on the compute nodes uh, and VLAN, do VLAN tagging, for example, directly on the compute nodes and not having to uh, route the traffic through a virtual router on the, on the network node. Uh, you also don't need to use NAT. Uh, you could, of course, use some kind of, um, of uh, enterprise, other enterprise NAT platform if you want to, but it's not, not at all necessary and it's not within OpenStack. Uh, exactly as uh, with the, um, with the uh, floating IP uh, case before, you can use RBAC rules to, um, to create policies and, uh, and limit which projects are, are able to, um, to use the shared network. When it comes to pros here, uh, it is also widely used. Uh, it doesn't require any, uh, not doing any natting and you can uh, let the traffic egress uh, directly on the compute nodes, so network nodes won't be a bottleneck. Uh, the con might also be that the traffic egress directly on the compute nodes, depending on how your network infrastructure, what your network infrastructure looks like. Uh, if you, for example, only have access to the VLANs from the network nodes, this might not be possible to do, so it depends, depends if it's a pro or a con. It can also be a little bit less flexible than floating IPs. It's not as easily to, easy to reserve and, uh, and uh, assign the specific IP addresses to specific resources. And you basically just create a, a shared network. Um, and if you want to, uh, to uh, use RBAC, you will do the same thing there, but the policy access as shared instead of um, access as uh, external. Then we have the L2 GV. It's basically an API to create uh, layer two links between physical networks and uh, VLANs and uh, OpenStack tenant networks. Uh, in this case, it will egress on specific uh, L2 GV servers. Uh, 
it could be com combined with other services, of course, but, but it's a specific service that, that uh, does the egress. And you don't have to use any NAT. So the pros, L2 connections, uh, you, you get the, your L2 connections centralized in one location. Um, and it's API driven and pretty much self-service. Cons might be that it's not as wi widely used. Uh, so it might be a huge, larger risk to find bugs there, for example. And uh, not, not as much examples available when it comes to configuration. Uh, also, the L2 gateways could, of course, become bottlenecks as they, uh, as they um, uh, connect all the, uh, uh, the L2 connections. So, uh, there is some configuration that you have to do before uh, to, on, on uh, setting up agents for, uh, for L2 and GV and so on. But when that is done on the uh, L2 gateway, you basically just uh, uh, create an L2 uh, uh, connection to a specific interface and a specific segmentation ID on uh, the L2 uh, GV. And then you connect that to a specific network. Then you have VPN as a service. Um, here you basically create the L3 connections between a tenant network and uh, some other IPsec service. It might be uh, another um, OpenStack uh, VPN as a service, or it might be uh, um, your office uh, IPsec gateway or a data center gateway or whatever, anything that speaks IPsec basically. And it's completely self-service, no setup uh, except for uh, enabling, um, uh, enabling uh, VPN as a service is required by, uh, by the um, uh, service provider. So it's all done by the customer by themselves. Uh, the traffic egresses uh, and the IPsec uh, connection is terminated on the network nodes inside the, uh, the uh, namespace, the router namespace. So, uh, a pro there uh, is, of course, it's encrypted, it's IPsec, and it's fully self-serviced, self uh, and no, 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 the provider is not re required to do anything to make it work or to configure it for specific customers. Uh, the cons might be encryption. It, uh, if it's not necessary in a, in a case where you have, for example, uh, the network between uh, between. Uh, the two locations is uh, trusted for some reason. So it will, of course, um, uh, give you some performance penalty. Uh, it's not quite as stable as uh, many of the other uh, solutions, as you, this requires that the IP sex session is actually up and running. And it's more moving parts uh, compared to, for example, in direct L2 connection or direct L3 connection. Uh, also, the complexity, it's, um, it has all the complexity of IPsec, so uh, it's um, lots of uh, knobs to turn to be able to, to make sure that uh, it's configured the same in both locations. And also, for the customer, it might be a con that, uh, that this complexity that you can't see logs from, uh, from the um, uh, OpenStack side of things, so it's harder to troubleshoot for the customer. So VPN as a service, you just set it up by uh, first creating um, uh, Ike policies and IPsec policies. Uh, there you can set, of course, uh, all the aspects of uh, the Ike uh, and IPsec negotiations. Uh, and then you create the, v the VPN service uh, for the specific router where you, where you want it terminated. And create endpoint groups, which is uh, basically just uh, pointers to what networks that are going to be routed through the um, IPsec tunnel. In this case, one uh, of type subnet, which is uh, your local, uh, local subnet, and the remote um, subnet by type CIDR, uh, as you uh, want to provide the, the uh, sitter of the remote uh, uh, network that you're connecting to. Um, then you create the, the site connection between uh, uh, to, to the peer address uh, of the other end of the IPsec connection. Uh, 
and provide a pre-shared secret to, um, uh, that has to be the same, of course, on, in both locations. Uh, then we have the BGP VPNs. Those are really great if you already have BDP IP VPN infrastructure in place. Um, and they can be both L2 or L3. Uh, it depends on how you set them up. And there is an admin part and a self-service part. Uh, I'm getting to that in a, two slides. And in this case, the traffic will egress on the network nodes as well. Uh, the pros here, as I said, it integrates very well with the existing infrastructure. Uh, if you have a an, an, uh, BDP IP VPN infrastructure, you have, an, um, for example, an MPLS network or uh, infrastructure like that in place, it will be a very easy way to, to plug, uh, plug uh, OpenStack resources into, into that uh, infrastructure. It's partly self-serviced. Uh, one of the parts is uh, when you set up uh, uh, route targets and stuff like that, you need to be administrator, so that's set up by the provider, and uh, then the customer can uh, create connections uh, by themselves. Uh, it generally, and the con uh, can be there, that it generally requires uh, BDP VPN infrastructure. You need to have some, something in place that already uh, uh, has this infrastructure. Uh, on the other hand, you could use it uh, directly between, uh, between uh, for example, two uh, OpenStack clouds and have them exchange routes directly, but to get the full, uh, get everything out of this uh, solution, you, you would probably want uh, a BDP VPN infrastructure in place. But if you have that, it's, um, really easy to just set up uh, and uh, configure the right route targets and, um, and uh, connect it to a project and then set, uh, uh, set a name for it and then the user, in this case, can um, uh, associate uh, networks to that uh, already set up uh, uh, BGP VPN uh, uh, that you have created as an admin. Uh, this is a little bit outside of the, of the scope, but uh, trunking might be useful in some cases uh, when you're connecting external resources as well. It's basically that you can expose multiple tagged VLANs uh, to a virtual machine instance instead of just having to create uh, separate uh, NICs for each uh, network you're connected to. This could be internal networks, it, uh, tenant networks, or it could be um, uh, connections to provider networks as well. And that's, of course, useful either, uh, might be useful for firewalls and routers, but it could also be useful um, if you, in any case that you need many, uh, access to many VLANs from, uh, from a, a single instance and don't want to create uh, multiple NICs. <coughs> and in this case, uh, you create uh, this is an example where you create two networks with different uh, segments, uh, uh, provider segments set, and a couple of subnets for, uh, for those, and then create uh, uh, the first, uh, I create ports for, for the both, um, both the networks, on both the networks. Then you create the trunk from uh, the parent port, which will in this case will, will be port zero. And you can uh, then, uh, with the trunk set command, add, add uh, more uh, uh, port, uh, ports to the, uh, uh, to the trunk. And in, that, in this case, get more uh, segmentation IDs, which uh, uh, will be VLANs. And in this case, uh, I choose to inherit the, uh, the segmentation type from the networks, you can also set that manually if you, if this is, for example, like uh, internal networks that don't have a provider segment ID. So, some considerations that you have to, uh, 
really think about. Uh, of course, you need to make sure that you don't get any IP address overlapping in any, uh, any of those cases. And that's, of course, true both for, uh, for um, uh, layer two as well as layer three connections. Uh, even more so if you have uh, L2 connections where you actually have to uh, think more about address allocation as well. Um, there might be cases where, uh, where you uh, connect to layer two networks and uh, you have to consider where's the, where's the DHCP coming from in this case. Uh, will there be a risk that uh, two separate DHCP instances will allocate the same, same, same IP addresses to multiple instances on the different sides? Uh, in this case, it might be a good uh, thing to, um, to add an external IPAM to the mix and to be able to, uh, to control the IP address allocations from, uh, from someplace uh, central. Or you could go direct the direction of using different uh, allocation pools, uh, making sure that networks uh, on respective side uh, has the same uh, network uh, sitter, but allocates IP addresses from uh, different um, allocation pools. For example, uh, if you have a slash 24, uh, one side will allocate only from the first uh, uh, half of the slash 24 and the other from the second, second half of the 24. Uh, in general, you could say that uh, the, uh, all the parts in, uh, in OpenStack are very flexible. You can really mix and match, and uh, there are lots of ways to do different things and, um, and uh, to connect uh, all kinds of resources uh, in one way or another. Uh, in general, you can just uh, consider that it, those parts are pretty much like uh, normal physical networking. You have a virtual router that is uh, pretty much, uh, easy, uh, pretty much uh, to be seen as a normal physical router. You can connect ports to it, you can connect interfaces, you can do routing, you can do everything that you can basically do in a physical router. Um, and you can connect, connect things in uh, all kinds of ways. And as I said, you can really mix and match things. Uh, you could, for example, use a customer-specific provider network uh, that we talked about earlier. And you could attach it to a router port uh, on, uh, on a virtual router. And then uh, use a link network uh, with a slash 30 subnet uh, with one uh, uh, address, in this case, on the router port and the other address on some other physical equipment or um, physical router or whatever. And then you can create static routes on the, on the virtual router to, um, uh, and terminate this in, uh, in some other part of the, your network infrastructure and transport, transport it elsewhere. And this can, of course, be used to connect any tenant network with, um, with, uh, with anything outside. Yeah. Do we have any questions? Yes? Sorry? Uh, you can do uh, HA routers, uh, and if you do HA routers, that is basically a router that is, uh, lives on multiple uh, network nodes and uh, uses VRRP to, uh, to fail over between uh, those network nodes if, if one of them is to fail. Does that answer your question? Okay, good. Any other questions? Um, yes? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, which of those uh, methods to, ex uh, to connect external networks play well with DVR? Uh, sorry, could you re repeat the question? So you, you um, displayed several methods to connect external network resources. Uh, which of them play well with distributed virtual routing? I think you could use space, pretty much all of them uh, in, uh, in uh, conjunction with, uh, with the DVR. Uh, yeah, I think I think so. I think you could use all of them. In uh, you, you do have some cases with NAT, and you have uh, might need network nodes after all to do a specific NAT uh, 
NAT conversions, but uh, in general, you could use all of them uh, with uh, DVR as well. So if I open my network, say, with a shared network provider uh, to the underlay, is there any way as an operator I can enforce packet rules that go from the VMs or from the virtual networks into my underlay? Can I say only these destinations are allowed or only these source IP addresses are allowed in the underlay then to access or to get out from uh, into the underlay? I mean, you do have port security uh, rules that uh, will will uh, won't allow any uh, that you spoof. You, you mean uh, you, you don't want uh, the customer to be able to spoof um, uh, addresses? Yes, to spoof addresses and also to only reach uh, specific targets in my underlay. Say I'm building somehow a database as a service in the underlay because I do it there and the customer, the VMs, have to reach some services in my underlay, but I only want to reach des uh, specific services uh, in this underlay and not the whole uh, network, where, what it can reach. I would think that for the, for the last uh, part of the question, I would probably use some ex external infrastructure or, um, or uh, rules directly on, on the infrastructure that, that you have. Uh, it's not something I would use uh, uh, OpenStack functionality for. Thank you. More questions? Okay, thank you. <laughs>